Hello, everybody. I hope you're ready for week two of Lives of the Famous Artists, uh, Masterpieces, Messes, and have the book, What the Neighbors Thought. Okay. There's a little uh, twist if you're actually going by the syllabus. That's a little addition I have to make today. I discovered that uh, the story on Rembrandt was just too short to meet a good time frame today, right? So I added another uh, artist. Maybe my Japanese students know. Maybe some Asian students know. Probably my American students don't know. But uh, this should be interesting nonetheless. Okay, so you're gonna get two for the price of one. Uh, the two people don't make it extra long, but two people are gonna try to make it just enough time. And there'll just be a little variety on you. Then the questions should be uh, uh, easy, not more complicated, all right? All right, and we'll see who the second mystery guest is. So let me go through my usual routine, share the screen, go to the material, slide, slideshow, not side, that's a sideshow begin in the circus from the beginning. Here we go. School code HUM 105, Humanities 105, the official title, The Intimate or Secret Lives of the World's Most Famous Artists. And this is scheduled, our second assignment is scheduled for April the 10th, 2023 of the spring quarter, can it be? All right. Okay, so we're gonna start with the well-known Rembrandt. He was a Dutch artist, okay. Uh, his full name, which in America, we just know him as Rembrandt. So we say typical, I guess long foreign names are a bit tough for us traditionally. Okay, so it's Rembrandt, Harmensun van Ridged. Is that a good pronunciation? I don't know how to speak Dutch. Rembrandt von Richt, okay? So this stuff is not portrait by. But this is his self-portrait, okay? Looks like 40-something years old, I don't know, but he painted this of himself. There was no pictures at the time, so it's the best that we'll get. Okay, so that's what it looked like. Okay, so again, I start with a little background information, so if people are not familiar you know, if I throw off terms, Rembrandt or Michelangelo or Da Vinci, who is this? Does that guy own a nightclub over on Fifth Street downtown? No. So I'll just let you know some of their major artwork, what kind of style they did, stuff like that. Then get into the intimate lines. Okay. All right. Rembrandt, in full Rembrandt, Harmonson von Rich. Rembrandt originally spelled Rembrandt. Born July 15th, 1606, so a little while ago, according to agree. In, uh, I don't know if that's Leiden or Leiden, Netherlands, even though I, I've actually been to Holland one time. And died October 4th, 1669. So I am correct. Let me see. Well, we'll do it the old slow way, right? 16, 26, 36, 46, 56, 66. Okay, he lived 63 years old, which actually is kind of long for a lot of people died in their 40s. Maybe art kept them going. In Amsterdam, which I went to, Dutch Baroque painter. So that's the style he's famous for, Baroque. Also a printmaker. One of the greatest storytellers in the history of art. Possessing or having an exceptional ability to render people, which means he drew them, painted them, in their various moods and dramatic guises. guises. Now, it could be called a costume or the way they're trying to hide their emotions, but he brought the emotions out in his art. 
Rembrandt is also known as a painter of light and shade. It's very difficult. It's one thing to, let's say, well, you know, the person, not me because I have no art ability, but a person says, I'm going to paint an orange, right? You say, hey, that's pretty good. A lot of people can paint an orange. It's like, but can you paint the shade or the shadow that it makes in the background? Huh? Or you paint an orange on a table, but then Rembrandt was able to paint the sun coming through the window. These are different areas of light and shade. And as an artist who favored an uncompromising realism that would lead some critics to claim that he preferred ugliness to beauty. So let me explain that to you. That's a very interesting state. Okay, if you're not familiar with the term uncompromising, it means that whatever you want to put forth is an idea, you don't make any excuses. You're behind it 100%. There's no, well, maybe, you know, and then realism. So, uh, so it says that will lead some critics to claim that he preferred ugliness to beauty. So uh, a lot of art at the time was aimed towards beauty. And he wanted realism. And unfortunately, most of the time, realism is not beautiful. So, you know, uh, maybe I'm trying to think of a good analogy for you. Uh, maybe he would be popular now with zombie movies, you know, because people don't want to see like a fake killing or zombies fake eating. You want to have it look as real as possible. It's like, oh, that was that the guy's guts that came out or the eye popped? You know, almost like a CSI. So he wanted to catch anything in his art. You don't want to cover it up and say, oh, well, let's paint this in a beautiful style. Right? So it was uncompromising, uh, realistic. So here in the middle, early in his career and for some time, Rebet painted a few portraits. A lot of folks started that way. Although he continued to paint and etch, etch is a form of drawing, black pencil white uh, background, and occasionally draw portraits throughout his career. He did so less frequently over time. Roughly, or about one-tenth of his painted and etched beauvoir consists, if you like his works, of studies of his own face. So a lot of his early stuff was his own face, as well as more formal self-portraits fact that has led to much speculation. That is also if you talk to artists. That's also a different high level skill. Maybe you're good at you know, being a portrait and drawing other people or painting other people, but it's very difficult they say to do yourself. It looks realistic. Okay, the core, the center of Rembrandt's work, however, consists of biblical and to a much lesser extent, historical, mythological, which you know, every country has their own myths, right? and allegorical history pieces, all of which he painted, etched or sketched in pen. And we're talking about ink, like pen and ink or chalk, which since we do whiteboards now in the class with markers, I don't, I don't know if you guys remember the blackboard with a white chalk that can make you itch when it makes a certain sound. So he also drew in chalk. Seen over his whole career, the changes in Rembrandt's style are remarkable. He changes. His approach to composition and 
his rendering of space and light, like his handling of contour, which is shape, form and color, his brushwork, that is painting, and in his drawings and etchings, his treatment of line and tone are subject to gradual or sometimes abrupt, quickly changed transformation, even within a single work. So you might be painting a certain style or something, bomb, changes it into some other kind of style. The painting known as Night Watch, 640 and 642 was clearly a turning point in his stylistic development. So, if you want to sound smart about Rembrandt, you say, yeah, I love his Night Watch. Wow, this person really knows. These changes are not the result of an involuntary evolution. Rather, they should be seen as documenting a conscious search in pictorial and narrative respects sometimes in discussion, as it were, with his great predecessors. So, uh, what I can try to translate that for you is that he's making an attempt in his artwork to communicate or be on the same level with the great artists that came. Okay. Sorry to say he understood them and their art uh, techniques. Okay, we're here on the bottom. Rembrandt quickly achieved renown. Renown means like a wide fame among Dutch art lovers and an art buying public for his painting and etchings, as well as his portraits and self-portraits. His unusual etchings brought him international fame, so on site, probably all through Europe during his lifetime and his drawings, which in fact were done as practice exercises or as studies for other works were also collected by contemporary art lovers. They wanted, these art lovers wanted anything they could get their hands on, even if it was just practice stuff. Okay, that's how good it was. According to the myth that he falls after his death, Rembrandt died poor and misunderstood. That's the case with most artists. A lot of times they die and they have not become famous yet. He had died, or become famous, but he had his own problems, which we'll see when I get into his life. But they were misunderstood. People could not. But look at Picasso's work. It's like, what is that? It's the guy drunk and later, God, what an artist, what an ability. Even though I don't understand the weird supposition of pictures that are in front of me. Uh, it is true that by the end of his life, his realism had been supplanted or changed to by classicism. So he stopped being a realistic painter and liked the classics. And thus he had become unfashionable or unpopular in Holland. Nevertheless, his international reputation among connoisseurs, that's a French word. We use French words in English now and then. A connoisseur in this area would be like an art lover, then a collector, only continue to rise. So in Holland, they said, what is this crap painting the classics? But his international fame, uh, his art lovers and collectors said, hey, to come and maybe you like anything you do. Certain artists in 18th century Germany and Venice even adopted his style, so they were copying his style again outside of Holland. He was venerated, which was highly respected during the Romantic area in Europe, he was considered a forerunner, so it means he came first of the Romantic movement. At that point, he was regarded as one of the greatest figures in art history. In the Netherlands itself, his fortunes have once again risen, and he has become a symbol of both greatness and Dutchness. So, even today, Dutch people hold him in very high regard, even though he had a little downtime there. All right, now let's get into those. Misunderstood lines. 
Okay, so this is a, he didn't do this. This is a modern rendition of him. This is his famous Dutch masters right here. All right. The books he used to read, how he dressed, right? Okay. So from riches to rags, so it means he was very famous, had a lot of money, and then at the end he became very poor. So it says here, his title is uh, the greatest master of the Dutch school of art, painter of historical scenes and expressive portraits of himself and others. Wow. Here at the bottom, Rembrandt uh, von Rijen experienced one of history's most rapid rises to the top. So he got famous very quickly. At age 13, he left school to study art. 70, he started his own studio, and by his mid-20s, he was the leading portrait painter to the richest families in the richest city in Europe, Amsterdam. So look at that. Would any of you guys, and I'm assuming most of you, students here at East in my class, are in your 20s. Can you imagine going back 10 years to when you were 13 and say, forget school, forget middle school, high school, going to college, I'm going to study art. Wow. Pretty brave. And then at 17, you had your own, you know, how is that possible? And then by his mid-20s, like you guys now, you are now suddenly the leading portrait painter to the richest families in the richest city, Europe, Amsterdam. I'm sure you can charge them whatever you want. You know, you imagine. Wow. Pretty cool. Maybe that's why this is the first part is the richest. Okay. For the next 20 years, it seemed that everything Rembrandt touched turned to gold, like the famous story of Midas, right? With people begging him to paint them. He worked nonstop and could turn out a portrait every two weeks. Okay. I have no interest in having a portrait made of myself, but maybe one of uh, my students here has had that. The sons of the rich flocked to him. Flocked is a term used for like birds. Many birds show up. So many rich people showed up to him. I want to be your student, your pupil. Please teach me your technique. And he took on up to 50 at a time. So he sent people outside the studio and said, okay, this first 50, I'll take you guys. What happened later, I know that they passed. Who knows? It's probably not easy to learn his techniques and have no art ability like myself, and for sure it's not going to happen. His students imitated him as much as possible, and they even dressed like him. Now, if that's all it took, then I would hope I could dress like him and then I would instantly get the talent. But I don't think it works like that. Although there were complaints that Rembrandt sometimes signed their paintings and sold them as his own. Those were complaints now. And some resentment of his constant uh, so resentment, anger, jealousy, of his constant experimentation. So, for example, they're trying to tell you right here, parenthesis, why did his heroes, heroines, lady girls, for instance, look so much like his ordinary neighbors, right? So you can imagine you paint a body of Superman or Aquaman or You know, you name it. And, but the face belongs to your friend who lives down the street. Uh, you know, 
Why did he do things like that? And then it said he laughed between his trips to the bank. Bank, you'll pay. I'll take the money. I'll go to the bank. Okay. Interesting sidelight there, right? Rembrandt married Saskia, the wealthy cousin of the man who sold his paintings. And together they bought one of the biggest houses in town. They furnished it luxuriously, which is extravagantly or with any rich style, with green velvet chairs, the latest style, built in beds with piles of down pillows. Oh, one pillow is not enough. And a legendary art collection. So he also spent money, a lot of money, on other artists, on artwork where he lived. Dealers raised their prices when they saw Rembrandt coming. <laughs> so again, they said, this guy's so rich. Like, I would sell this painting to Barry B for 10000 but Rembrandt's coming. Let's put it up to fifty. Half the money. And, strangely enough, he enjoyed outbidding everyone else just for fun. I've heard that about, let's say, famous, rich, famous athletes, actors, a lot of times they do things that are ridiculous, the amount of money that they spend or lose just because they can. I remember reading stories about, you know, the old famous basketball player, Michael Jordan and Charles Barkley, uh, multimillionaires, and they go to Vegas just for the fun of a gamble and lose a couple hundred thousand dollars. The same, well, it's be too much to me. So in this case, Rembrandt saying, I don't care who bids what, the richest guy in the county here, I'm going to outbid him. Why? Just because I have the money. Which probably wasn't a smart thing, considering we know that later he's going to die poor. But... Uh, a lot of rich people do things like that. Um, you know, I remember reading about Kim Kardashian before she was going to marry Kanye West. They had to get the mansion together, the 40 room mansion. Again, they're not going to get 40 people to stay there, but just because they can. And then there was a holdup where it wasn't, they could not move in. I wondered what was it, the plumbing, the air conditioning? They didn't connect the uh, electricity. Why couldn't they move in? They couldn't do it because Kim had decided 40 room, 40 restroom. She wanted every toilet to be gold because she only wanted to sit on gold or bottom. So these folks do things because they can. All right. He also collected expensive clothes, so not only art, but clothes, jewelry, expensive jewelry for Saskia, and props to use in his paintings, seashells, weapons, and musical instruments. So he put these items into his paintings. The house had enough bedrooms for many children, just like the Kardashian. But over the years, as their infants failed to survive, which was very common back then. Um, that's why people had a lot of kids. It's like you would hear stories like the wife actually had 10 kids. Why? Well, three or four of them died, you know, during the time that they raised their kids. So it's better to have as many as you could. Medical was not as good then. Uh, he turned the rooms into storage space for his collection. So it was not enough to, let's say, have famous paintings on your wall. He wanted even more that he didn't even look at, but had them locked away in the closet. I, I, 
not an, uh, an artist or an art person, but uh, I would guess if I was collecting art, I, I, me personally, I would just want what I could have in my living room and say, I, 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 well, not what I'm going to lock away in a closet just so I can say I have them. But everybody's different. That's why there are some people who collect everything. You know? uh, Rembrandt drew himself wearing furs, which are expensive, and gold chains and other exotic accessories. But here's the contrast, the paradox. In real life, he usually wore old clothes stained with paint. So what he presented to the public uh, for his image and how he really was uh, two different things. A quiet homebody, he made meals out of herring, which is a fish. Right, that's very popular in Japan. Bread and cheese, so very basic stuff. It's also interesting. Sasuke unfortunately died young and left their one surviving infant son. So I don't know how many kids they had, but a lot of them died and only had one surviving son, Titus. Devastated, which means almost destroyed emotionally, and almost sick with loneliness, as his wife was gone and the other kids, Rembrandt fell into two relationships apparently at the same time. Oh dear. With Titus's nanny, Gertie, and with his family's maid, Henry J. So, fell in love with two ladies at the same time. Is that possible? Ladies, tell me, did you fall in love with two guys at the same time? I don't know. The terms of Saskia's will required that he didn't remarry. Interesting. So if she was going to give him anything, money or anything, he could not remarry. <laughs> Otherwise, he wouldn't get them. But uh, Gurji, one of the ladies he fell in love with, took him to court saying he had promised to marry her. Uh-oh. She wanted his thing. She knew his thing was very vital. So took him to court on a promise. One of Rembrandt was ordered to support her. Oh, a good. But with her brother's help, he had her committed to an asylum instead. Asylum is slang. Uh, we call slang term crazy house. So I don't know if she was crazy. Obviously, from here I can see she was greedy. I don't know why a court supported her because she was not married to him. I mean, people promise each other stuff all the time. How can you find someone to? Well, he made a promise to me to shine my shoes. You know, the guy never said that. Well, okay, he has to shine shoes now. What? Uh, so, but somehow he had her sent away to a crazy house. Uh, the scandal deepened or got worse when he and Hendrik said the other girl he fell in love with had a daughter. Uh oh. Something going on there. My daughter's name was Cornelia with him, but they married. Married. That would be called back in the day out of wedlock. Gossiping friends avoided him. Did not want to be touched by the scandal. And the local church summoned for four times for review. That was very seen as a very bad thing for a woman to have a baby. Lock. Uh, maybe they also thought that was her technique to get money from him where the other woman just took it to court and not come promise but uh, Henry Jack said hey I actually had his daughters well uh, Rembrandt's work gradually fell out of fashion so it stopped being popular and that happens I mean uh, look at movie stars. There's some people that are hot for two years, three years, five years, and then they kind of fade away. They make some low-level movies that are not a success, or most people don't see. 
and they don't work for a couple of years. And it's like, man, that guy was hot five years ago. Where is that guy? You know? So it also happens with artists. So including with his work fell out of fashion, his stubbornness did not help his reputation. Once when he refused to remove a monkey from the portrait of a family that had no monkey, they refused to buy a painting. Now look at that. What if you go demand a painting and the guy, I will make it like this, and you let the guy know, oh, I'm a vegetarian, right? And then this artist paints you eating a steak. You're like, the hell no, this, I do not eat meat. What are you doing? And then the artist, I refuse. I think you look good eating a steak, you know? So that was clearly stubbornness. I can tell you kind of on a, uh, from my experience on a light level, uh, way back in the day, uh, I actually lived at a record store. And, uh, my good friend owned the record store and uh, he was a DJ. And he was pretty good. But the other young TJs were like, you know, he never gets uh, return bookings from the people. It doesn't matter if he does a wedding or Sweet 16, what's called a quinceanera. Just a regular house party. And then I found out why. I went with him uh, to do his gigs. And a lot of times he refused to play songs and music lists that the customer wanted. And that's the number one thing when you do that is customer satisfaction. Same thing with Rembrandt. So they want these songs and he's in his line, hell no, I don't like that music. I'm going to play what I want. So he got the gig for that night. So in Rembrandt's case here, as his work became less popular, his stubbornness made the situation worse with his remaining uh, customers. And then, like I said, he was rich before, but he was always careless with his money, just like modern people. Mike Tyson's another one, a uh, couple of million dollar, you know, homes across the country, he lost them. Uh, Rembrandt eventually went bankrupt. After he was forced to sell everything, he owned at a fraction of its worth, which means, I guess everything is home, everything, the value just wrong. Kind of like our economy now. He spent his last 13 years in dignified poverty. So that's an interesting state there. Poverty we know is being very poor. But dignified is he was like, you know, I have my own self-respect and I could care less if I'm poor, which is an interesting way of looking at things where people do not have a dignified poverty, maybe they become depressed and uh, become alcoholics or put them down, maybe drugs. So it says here, he pretended not to be at home when creditors called back, reminds me of my friend too. People came asking for money. He disappeared from home. You know? Very interesting. People like that have an ability to do those things. Okay, so, and I guess with the ladies, you know, he wore them out. He weighted them out. So Henry Che and Titus both died. And I wonder what age Titus was. He was a teenager. And then Rembrandt lived on with Cornelia, which you will remember was the daughter that he had with Henry Che. And his eyesight started feeling. That happens too with a lot of artists. They have to squint and pay attention to detail that most humans don't have to do it in. Isaac, so I was correct. When he died at the age of 63, math wasn't that bad. Possibly of the plague, that's terrible. We talk about black plague, spread by rats in Europe at the time. It sounds like 
the high percentage that that's what he got infected. There was no public notice, and he was buried in an unmarked grave. So people don't know where he is buried. No? Because it was done so quickly or because of the situation. Crazy, you can go from super famous to where is the guy? You know, he didn't, where did he get buried? Okay, artworks. A little more of the artworks here. There's this jeweled bag that he held his money in. Now, let me lesson of Dr. Tulit. Or a portrait of surgeons dissecting a body. That's in his realistic period. So, like I said about the zombies or CSI. Who wants to see a painting where people are cutting open the body, especially at that romantic period? And it was of a criminal known as the Kid. It was Rembrandt's first important commission or work of art. This was a time when people paid to, to see dissections at an anatomy theater, which were unheated to prevent the corpse from decaying too fast. So these theaters were full, but I guess they charged money so that people could see doctors cut a open body. I think I want to see that today. Another painting of his is the Night Watch, probably the most famous Dutch painting of all time. It doesn't show a night scene and no one is keeping watch. <laughs> Interesting. The title was added 150 years after the painting was completed when it had darkened with age, so it's call it night. All the models paid Rembrandt to be included in the painting. That's how famous he was. The people in the front of the picture contributed more money than the ones in the back. That's one way to do it. On a close-up, pay more money. Although it was thought for years to be one of Rembrandt's greatest works, a man with a golden helmet is now believed to be one of his students. Since 1968, a team of scholars known as the Rembrandt Research Project has been studying his work. So far, they have reduced the number of genuine Rembrandt paintings from 700 to 350, so half, much to the dismay of many museums. So that's pretty bad. You're a famous museum and you say, we have 20 famous works from Rembrandt. And then this Rembrandt Research Project team comes in there and they say, actually, you have five from Rembrandt, 15 are from the students, which is verified. So, it's not good for the museum. It's popularity. Okay, this is the mystery man of the second one to fill up the time. Hokusai. Okay. So, Katsushika Hokusai. October 1760 to 10 May 1849, known simply as Hokusai, the Japanese Yukio E artist of the Edo period. So, a very productive time in old Japan. Active as a painter and printmaker, he is best known for the woodblock print series, 36 views of Mount Fuji, which includes the iconic print, The Great way of Kanagawa, which everybody has seen in one way or another. It's one of my favorites. It's a great blue and white wave. Hokusai was instrumental in developing yukioi from the style of portraiture largely focused on courtesans, which uh, I'll let you look that up if you want. They're entertaining ladies of the time, entertaining, and actors into a much broader style of art that focused on landscapes, plants and animals. His works are thought to have had a significant influence on Vincent van Gogh, who we'll cover later, Claude Monet during the wave of Japonisme that spread across Europe in the late 19th century. So in love with Japanese art, Europe at that time. Okusai created the monumental 36 views of Mount Fuji as a response to a domestic travel rule in Japan as a part of a personal interest in Mount Fuji. It's known that he was fascinated with Mount Fuji. It was the series, specifically the Great Wave, my favorite, of Kanagawa, and the fine wind, clear morning that secured his fame and 
both Japan and overseas. Hokusai was best known for his woodblock Yukioe prints, but he worked in a variety of mediums, including painting and book illustration. Starting as a young child, he continued working and improving his style until his death, age 88. So he lived quite a bit longer than uh, ever. Uh, in a long and successful career, Hokusai produced over 30,000 paintings, art, sketches, woodblock prints, and images for picture books in total. Innovative in his compositions and exceptional in his drawing technique. Okusai is considered one of the greatest masters in the history of art. And I'll tell you, 90% of American people don't know who he was. Interesting. Great claim to fame. Okay. This is a self-portrait of him at 83. He drew himself. Right. This is the picture from the book. There's his great wave. Everybody's familiar with this usually in a dark or a white color, and his love for Mount Fuji, chili peppers, his paintbrush. You will see why they got him. They have him here painting with his foot. Why? Okay. So we go, old man, mad, which means crazy, about drawing. That's a chica okusai. 1760 and died in 1849 in Edo, or Japan. Japan paint, Japanese painter and printmaker known for his enormous or giant influence on both Eastern and Western art. And history knows this Katsushika Hokusai was born in the year of the dragon in the bustling, which is a very busy city now known as Tokyo. After working for eight stormy or troublesome years in the studio of a popular artist who resented the boy's greater skill so he had greater skill than the mature artist the artist was jealous of him okusai was finally thrown out at first he learned he earned his daily bowl of rice as a street peddler so that means he was a beggar selling oh and he sold red peppers and Ducking if he saw his old teacher coming, which means he put his head down and hid. He didn't want his old teacher to see him on the street selling peppers to survive. Soon he was illustrating comic books, then turning out banners, made to order greeting cards for the rich, artwork for novels full of murders and ghosts, drawings of scenes throughout his beloved Edo. Changing one's name was a Japanese custom, but Hosai carried it to an extreme. He changed his more than 30 times. Can you imagine you have your name. What's your name? Uh, Yo-Yo Fei. I'm going to change it to Yo-Yo. I'm going to change it to Yo. I'm going to change it to Y. I mean, why 33 times? No one knows why. Hmm. Perhaps he craved variety, so he even loved variety in his own name, or was self-centered, which means egotistical, narcissistic. And he thought maybe that every change in his art style required a new identity. Interesting. So let's say, how can I say that? Let's say uh, you have an actor, or they start out famous for a comedy. So they have their name. Later they say, I'm going to be a dramatic actor now. So they need a name now. They change their name. And then after that, they say, oh, I'm just going to do love stories. and I need a new name to be a romantic actor. So strange, but that would be the equivalent. Or the last thing is he merely liked being eccentric. That's a way of saying he just liked being Unique. So if you remember Prince, the musician, for a while there, he didn't have a name. He said, I don't have a name. My name is a symbol. Right? Later, they went back to calling it Prince. But famous people like being unique.
One name he kept longer than most was Hokusai, meaning star of the northern constellation. In honor of a Buddhist god, he especially revered or respected. He did like variety in dwellings, which means places where he lived. Notorious, uh, which means famous, but not in a good way, for never cleaning his studio. Uh-oh. That smells. He took the easy way out whenever the place became too disgustingly dirty. He moved. So that could be similar to uh, be ready. I hope you're strong. I have known some guys that were so lazy when I was younger that, again, I hope you're strong. They didn't wash laundry. So let's say they wore underwear until it was so dirty they couldn't stand it anymore. Maybe the white underwear turned brown and they just threw them away, bought new underwear. Okay, so again, this fellow waited until his place was so disgustingly dirty that he just moved. Okay. How many times did he move? Because I moved a total of 93 times. Putting a burden on his family and creating a new set of neighbors for himself at least once a year. So he moved every year to a new area, neighbors. And somehow being dirty and moving and causing problems, he married twice and had seven children, most of whom died in their 20s, so kind of similar to Rembrandt. I think most of his kids died as kids. Still, what's going on in Japan at the time that they died in their twenties? Born showman, Okusai attracted attention by staging public performances of his art. So he got instead of a gown and said, "Hey, look at me! I'm going to perform painting for everyone." Spectators or watchers marvel, surprised when he drew birds in flight. It was a beautiful drawing. On a grain of rice, you know how small that is? Crowds cheered when he scrawled on a huge sheet of paper to paint with the brush the size of a room. So he was able to paint while lying on, let's say, rice paper and using a huge brush. These are different kinds of techniques, not just the beautiful artwork. Beautifully, but they can't paint on a grain of rice. Sometimes he painted while hanging upside down, or I guess from a tree, or with the brush held in his mouth, or between his toes. So that's why I told you they had the paintbrush held on his foot. Wealth didn't impress him. He was known to keep important clients waiting while he meticulously, which means step by step, one by one, picked all the fleas off his kimono. Rich people got there, they wanted their work, decided it was time to pick the fleas off his kimono, so he made them wait on purpose, kind of like stubborn Rembrandt. Again, these are eccentric folks. He lived simply, usually in poor neighborhoods, Plus, I drank tea and ate little. Again, very similar to Rembrandt. He mostly had rice cakes. He enjoyed a bowl of noodle soup before he went to bed. In the style of the times, he slept on a straw mat brought out from the closet every night. Money held no interest for him. I guess he didn't buy expensive things like when he had to pay bills, he would hand over one of the unopened envelopes of payments he had received for his art. Sometimes the money in the envelope matched the amount of the bill, sometimes it didn't, uh-oh. Okusai once went bankrupt, like Rembrandt, and to escape arrest by creditors, don't tell me he got away too. He changed his name yet again, went into hiding outside of town for a year. 
though he nearly died of starvation, running out of paper and paints was his worst nightmare. But that was above running out of food for him. Dark, he would walk 15 miles into Edo for supplies, 15 miles walking. Again, that's his nightmare, no paper and paints and supplies. Trying to return before anyone he owed money to recognized him. Older, I don't know how he got to be 88. The older Hokusai got, the harder he worked. Sitting on his heels, hour after hour, he completed over 30,000 pieces of art. A good question to ask. An average of one a day during the course of his life. He hoped for immortality, but made it to age. He wanted to live forever. The inscription of what was written on his grave stone shows his final name, Wakio Roji, meaning old man, mad or crazy about. Very interesting. I wonder if he told them to put that on his gravestone, or the persons that knew him decided that was an accurate title to put on his gravestone. Another <laughs> name change. Artworks. Hokusai's most famous images come from a series of prints called 36 Views of Mount Fuji, which reveal the sacred symbol of Japan from the various angles. The great wave, the view most often reproduced, shows Fuji framed in the curve of a wave about to engulf three fishing boats. Manga, or random sketches, was a 15 volume encyclopedia of Hokusai's drawing of Japanese life dragons, pagodas, wrestlers, and acrobats, whole pages of thin people or fat men. 1856, the friend of French artist Edgar Degas found Hokusai prints such as these being used as packing material in a crate of porcelain from Japan. The prints became all the rage, which is very, very popular, among most artists of the time. Hokusai became the most important figure in introducing Eastern art to the Western world. Today, each of those prints will be worth as much as fifty thousand dollars. Okay, that means we're done for the reading for both of these gentlemen. Let us proceed with the question. Rembrandt questions one in his mid twenties. Rembrandt accomplished what? But don't tell me, oh, he got a bank account at the U.S. Bank. He got a driver's license. I'm silly. Who did his hero or heroine paintings look like? Famous people? Ooh. Three, which things did he collect for his painting? Don't say paintbrushes and paint. You gotta read the material. How did he dress himself? Was it wild and scary? Fun. How did he spend his last year? With a beautiful wife and surrounded by 10 loving children. Is that how he did it? Okay, on to Katsushika Hokusai. First question, which kinds of art did Hokusai do in his early years? So give me a list. For my new people, if you only write one, you will not get as many points on your homework. Or if this is a midterm question, if you give me the whole list. Right? Usually this is not long, like 10 things, like three or four things. So the more you give, the more points you get. Okay. Seven, how many times did he change his name? Maybe once, legally? No, who knows? Eight, how did Hokusai attract attention? Did he pick up his clothes and run down the street? How did he do it? Nine, what did he do to make wealthy clients wait? He just yelled at them and said, wait. Okay. Ten, what did his name mean on the gravestone? Just covered it. Right? All right, so we did actually two people this week, two short uh, biographies, and uh, we're off. So, Stop share.
And I'll let you know again that this lesson is scheduled for the 10th of April. Okay, and I shall see you soon.